187 nautical mile Track 150 hosted Scramble mission 823 Scramble 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 mission 823 scramble initial vector 300 short profile contact sagar control channel alpha standby 5 This is Saga Control reading you. Strength five. Altitude control point three five kilometers. Speed point eight max. Continue climb point four five kilometers. Speed on top point nine max. Altitude control. else has seen the unclimbed peaks the rainbows end the real reasons why birds sing because i fly i envy no man for six decades the indian air force has operated ceaselessly in peace and war in defense of the motherland indeed this arm of the nation remains on constant vigil churning its radars flying by day and by night the boys in blue pushing themselves and their machines constantly to achieve perfection in their own eyes courage has always been a virtue and to forget the self and to die in the service of others is an act with a value of its own War is not the concern of airmen and soldiers only. Throughout history, civilian life has always been affected by warfare, and today, national security engulfs civilians as well as professional fighting men. For these reasons alone, military history is inseparable from the general historical background of the country, and which therefore concerns everybody, both in and out of uniform. This is the story about the men who guard our skies and how they by their actions sometimes shape the destiny of our country. It is the story of Indian airmen and certain virtues loyalty to comrades courage under stress and above all their commitment to the saffron white and green roundel which they parade to the heavens above with absolute pride. the magic of flying combat aircraft armed with some of the most sophisticated and potent weapon systems are the backbone of the indian air force today hugging the ground or flying at incredible heights at supersonic speeds man and machine are honed into a perfect combination to seek and destroy in the air is the pilot's skill sharpened through hours of endless training that must deliver in combat on the ground another all important factor also comes into play the disciplined dedication of the men behind the wings creating a team where trust and confidence are much more than just catchwords today 60 years after the somewhat modest beginning the indian air force is a mature and modern force 
equipped with state-of-the-art aircraft which compare with the best available anywhere in the world. While the fly-by-wire Mirage 2000 and the MiG-29 are the advanced interceptors which defend the Indian skies against any threat, the MiG-21 BIS, considered the ultimate variant of the classic tailed Delta fighter design, and the swing-wing MiG-23 MF, equipped with beyond visual range missiles, make up the bulk of the Indian Air Force's air superiority fighters. The role of the tactical airstrike aircraft is performed by the MiG-23BN and the MiG-27N, which are optimized for low-level, high-speed missions. The Jaguar strike fighter meets the Indian Air Force's deep penetration strike requirement, while the air transport wing of the Indian Air Force has grown systematically since 1946, and today the Air Force possesses the largest tactical airlift fleet in Asia, peaking with some 13 freighter, troop and logistical support squadrons, plus a number of communication flights. Day after day, AN-32 and IL-76 aircraft transport stores and troops in support of one of the most dramatic chapters in India's history, Operation Meghdoot. In this continuing saga of fortitude and skill, flying on virtually all days unless hampered by extreme bad weather, Mi-17s, Cheetah helicopters and AN-32s fly sortie after sortie, negotiating some of the world's most difficult passes and valleys, maintaining the vital air bridge to the Himalayan outposts of the Siachen Glacier, also referred to as the Third Pole. Guarding the frontiers in northern Ladakh, the Indian Army around the year mans posts at incredible heights which predominate the Siachen Glacier. More often than not, the only contact possible is by air, and the transport fleet has dramatically proved this capability over the years. Helicopters were to add a new dimension to flying after their induction into the Indian Air Force in the mid-50s. Sikorsky S-55s were followed by the smaller Bell 47s and suddenly the Indian Air Force was flying into regions where conventional fixed-wing aircraft could not go. By 1961, Russian Mi-4 helicopters and French Alouette 3s were flying under Indian colors. In the years since, as some helicopters were phased out of service, Others, like the Mi-8s, Mi-17s and Cheetahs, took their place, continuing to fly into the remotest parts of the country, not only in support of our defense forces, but often to aid civil population as well. Air Force came into being on 8th October 1932, but the first aircraft flight was not formed until 1st April 1933 with six RAF trained officers, 19 Hawaii Sipais and four Westland Wapiti Army Cooperation biplanes. Take that silly sheet off your head. Amarjit Singh, Bupinder Singh, Abhi Avan, H.C. Sarkar. 
on their way to the RAF Flying College at Cranville in 1930 was the culmination of a struggle towards greater representation of Indian youth in the defense services of the day. A first step, a breakthrough, for around these very men was to form the Indian Air Force as we know it today. things in later life would have held a candle to that unbelievable moment of metamorphosis. Addressed now as pilot officers, A flight, number one squadron, Dreeg Road, Karachi, and the date, 1st April, 1933. The initial operational experience of this infant air force started in the border province of undivided India under the shadow of the hills of Afghanistan. A flight of number one squadron from its base at Miran Shah took on the Waziris. September 1, 99. The German war machine swung into action. intensified, the newly formed IAF Volunteer Reserve stepped forward with 24 Indian pilots to fight alongside the RAF in fighter, bomber and coastal commands. Among them, Ranjan Dutt, Tirlochan Singh, Chopla, H.C. Divan, S.P. Shahi and Sanghi. At home, the Indian Air Force had been on the move. Coastal defense flights had been formed with bases in Karachi, Bombay, Cochin, Madras, Calcutta, and later, Vizag. December 7, 1941. Within 24 hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the subcontinent via Burma was within striking distance of the advancing Japanese forces, backed up by Zeros and Oscars overhead. But the Japanese invasion of Burma, first number four CDF, now number four squadron Indian Air Force, and then number three squadron under Haim Chaudhary, arrived in the inhospitable terrain of Burma. On 1st February 1942, number one squadron arrived at Tongu, re-equipped with a dozen Lysanders, a gift from the citizens of Bombay, and with Jumbo Majumdar as their squadron commander. Jumbo's improvised bombing of the Japanese from the antiquated Lysander exemplified the spirit of the Indian Air Force pilots.
all nine squadrons of the rapidly expanding IAF were to see frontline action in Burma again and again throughout 43, 44 and 45. Equipped with the Hurricane and in some cases the Vulti Vengeance dive bomber, the Indian Air Force were to fly 16,000 sorties involving over 24,000 operational flying hours with a serviceability of aircraft at an incredible 97 to 99 percent, sortie after sortie, in support of the 14th Army. The eyes of the 14th Army and the Arakan twins, that's what the soldiers in the jungles below call the hurricanes. Mahir Singh was the sole IAF officer to win the DSO. Jumbo Majumdar had been awarded the DFC in 1942 and he was now followed by others including squad leader Arjun Singh, squad leader PC Lal, flight lieutenant Pooji and flying officer JC Varma, the only Indian Air Force pilot to bring down a Japanese Oscar, an aircraft far superior to the ground attack Hurricane. In 1946, the prefix Royal was conferred on the Indian Air Force in recognition of its service during the Burma campaign. August 15, 1947, the long-awaited day of freedom had come and immediately the human tragedy of the streams of displaced people had to be dealt with. Partition ripped through the fabric of a nation. The Air Force too was split up. Of the 10 precious squadrons, three went to Pakistan, along with the bases at Karachi, Risalpur, Miran Shah and Peshawar. The skies over the subcontinent were divided. The main radar column seems to have assembled at Muzaffarabad and are going for Srinagar via the Uri Baramula axis. As far as we know, Srinagar may already be in the hands of these radar columns. So Lalu, you approach Srinagar and on finals, if there is any ground fire directed at you, give a call on RT and divert to Jammu. But Groupie Bhatia sir, what if the airfield is under their control and they don't fire? Well then, to save your skins, you better take off. But keep your engines going for God's sake and keep your eyes wide open. Alright? Kashmir was burning and no, Raja Hari Singh flights. turned to India for help. But not until the rape of Baramula did he sign the instrument of accession. Twenty-eight sorties were flown on the very first day of the operation, and this was just the beginning. The raiders, on a rampage of rape and plunder in Baramula, delayed themselves just that little bit to allow our aircraft a foothold to land and disgorge the first elements of the Indian Army into Kashmir. After the landing of troops in Srinagar, tempests from the bases in Amritsar and Ambala were moved to Srinagar to check the raiders' advance. Often scrounging fuel from the incoming Dakotas, the fighters played a crucial role in holding the raiders in check, giving the Indian Army time to push an infantry battalion supported by Ama into the valley over the Banihal Pass.
The fate of Srinagar hung in balance till 7th of November. The Battle of Shalatang. The raider columns ran into a perfectly laid ambush by 161 Brigade, with Indian armor getting in behind them on the Baramula Srinagar road and the RIAF above them. They had little choice but to fall back on Uri. With Srinagar relatively secure, attention could now be turned to the Western Front where Jhangar, Naushera, Rajori, Mirpur and Kotli were desperately holding out against the tribal Lashkars. By December 1947, the situation in Punj was critical. The thrust from Jammu towards Punj bogged down and the Srinagar Brigade failing to link up with the garrison there, the only way Poonch could be salvaged was from the air. Brigadier Pritham Singh, the garrison commander, along with the refugees, was desperately working on a landing strip under constant enemy artillery fire. And the man of the moment was Air Commodore Meher Singh of number one operational group. On December 12th, he landed the first Dakota at Poonch on a 600 meter improvised airstrip. Oh, Baba, the performance this morning by you and your boys has the entire country applauding. I just heard it on the radio. Thank you, sir. The boys are determined to land at points. Something else we need from you. I just got information from Brigadier Pritam Singh. The enemy has moved their medium artillery to bracket the airfield after your boys came back from Poonch. The light guns you landed are helpless because their 25 pounders are out of our reach. So you want us to get our 25 pounders there? That can be done first thing tomorrow morning. We feel that will be too late. We need you to go in tonight. Okay, sir. I'll go in with two aircraft. No, not you, Baba. The orders from Panditji are very clear on that. Pick two of your best pilots. Ladies, where are the ladies? Okay, okay. And gentlemen oh. of number 12 RIF squadron and one operational group. May I have the pleasure of presenting Air Commodore Baba Mahar Singh. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now, the Royal Light Club Band will present an operational version of the song, Poonching in the Mountains, to the tune of the Blue Danube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like each other is going to tell us a dirty joke. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I hate to spoil this party, but I need volunteers to fly into Poonch again. We all volunteers, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. The Raiders have moved medium artillery to encircle the airfield this evening. Okay, Reval and Pushong. Two aircraft are already loaded and ready to go. You have to land by the light of the moon, keep your engines running and get out of there as soon as you can. The operations which commenced with the airlift on 26th October 1947 reached a ceasefire only on 1st January 1949. A mammoth effort, often heroic, fighting in conditions where sometimes even heroism is not enough, as was the story of the long and bitterly defended fort at Skardu. While the newfound capability of airlifting Indian troops anywhere, anytime and anyhow was capturing the nation's imagination, three of our fighter squadrons flying Harvards, Spitfires and Tempests, fought along with our ground troops, relentlessly pushing the raiders back off Indian soil. After the ceasefire, the need to expand the Air Force of Independent India was recognized by the government, at first to 10 and thereafter a proposed 20 squadrons. Here we were at the Air Force Flying College, living out a dream every waking hour. All we had to do was to fly, fly and fly, getting the feel of the Tiger Moths and Harvards on which most of our generation was trained before moving on for advanced jet training on vampires to Hawking Pen. India became a republic in 1950 and the Air Force dropped the prefix Royal. The years that followed 
were to see changes on virtually all fronts. The piston-powered Air Force of yesteryear was to make way for another generation of aircraft and flyers on whose wings and shoulders would rest the mantle of the now maturing Indian Air Force and the man who was to lead them, Subrata Mukherjee, who in 1954 became the first Indian Chief of Air Staff. Mr. Weiss, the President. Gentlemen, the President. The President. Okay. Gentlemen, some of us around this table today will recall the long battles fought striving to make a success of the Indian Air Force at its birth. The Indian Air Force is what it is today mainly because of one thing, the imagination, the courage, the loyalty and the quality of its officers and its men. I am proud to be associated with this great fighting force, for they are truly the salt of the earth. The spirit of innovation came to the fore. Group Captain Harjinder Singh's salvage operation of the B-24 Liberator, dumped by the US Air Force, gave the Air Force its first bomber squadron. Towards the beginning of the 60s, our frontline squadrons had increased in number to double the IAF's strength since independence. Besides the hunters and the vampires, we had the Canberra bombers. For the Indian Air Force and its boys in blue, growing steadily in confidence by the day, this was to be a period of tremendous change. Have you seen this? What is it? The parade tomorrow. All the commands have to be given in Hindi only. And you, Jackie, are the parade commander. Parade! Parade! Good, 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 I forgot, sir. Carry on. With the rapid developments in Tibet, the American Fairchild Packet C-119 aircraft joined the IAF fleet. And in 1962, squad leader C.S. Rajay landed at Dalat Beg Oldi, which, at 17,400 feet, is the highest landing strip in the world. Chinese presence along our northern borders necessitated a reaction from India. And once again, the IAF transport fleet, now equipped with the powerful AN-12s, was to pick up the baton. Tight, navigator co-pilot. How much time to go for Dalat Beg Aldi? Approaching review, sir. Okay, prepare for drop. Open cargo doors. Opening doors, sir. Sir, Captain Dara, the firefighter starboard wing is hit. Engineer co-pilot, number 3 engine JPT going up. Captain, engineer number 3 engine JPT increasing. Advance to feather. Feather number 3. Feathering number 3 engine. Squad leader Chandan Singh's flight in an AN-12 over Dalat Beg Oldi marked the beginning of the war for the IAF. Sir. Looks like LMG fires. Quite a bit of it. Good shot. Good landing. The fighting with the Chinese erupted on the Nifa front at Namka Chu and at Chip Chap, east of Dalat Beg Oldi, on October the 20th, 1962. The IAF was used extensively in a supportive role. As the tempo of activity increased, the number of sorties flown by our transport aircraft 
assumed mammoth proportions. Often, aircraft which dropped supplies over Ladakh in the morning would find itself taking off from Tezpur with similar loads for our troops deployed in Nifa. While in the fighter squadrons, the pilots trained and trained to hone their skills. In the frustrating days that followed, the story was the same. Load rockets and bombs, stand by. Unload rockets and bombs, stand down. In this situation, the relatively new helicopter units had a major role to play. Number 110HU was diverted to Tezpur from Chandigarh and the helicopter pilots Johnson Berry, K.L. Narayanan, S.K. Majumdar, V.K. Saigal, M.S. Kapoor, A.S. William, Adlakha, Raj Gopal, B.S. Jaswal and Neil Todd were to become familiar names for the beleaguered detachments at Tawang, Dhola, Tezu and the Walong sector. How can a man die better than facing fearful hordes for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? General Ayub Khan's diversionary tactics in the run of Kutch were meant to be a smoke screen for Operation Grand Slam. The operation was launched on 5th August. The infiltrators crossed the ceasefire line at well-chosen points and reached deep inside Kashmir before they were detected. To counter the threat, a helicopter task force consisting of first two, then three squadrons was used extensively which had a great demoralizing effect on the raiders. Hajipir, Gurez, Badgam, Mandi, Tangdar, and Budil were bombed and strafed by these helicopter units. And the fighting gradually escalated all along the JNK border with open clashes at Kargil, Titwal, Uri, and Punch. The Pakistan Air Force came forward with Sabre jets and a few Lockheed star fighters the supersonic F-104. In support of the Pak Army, these aircraft had a formidable reputation after the Korean War, and about two dozen F-86 Sabre jets plus star fighters were armed with heat-seeking air-to-air sidewinder missiles. At 1600 hours on 1st September, the Defense Minister called up Air Marshal Arjun Singh and asked for air support to stem the massive Pakistani thrust into Cham By 1719 hours, 12 vampires from 45 squadron and misters from number 3 and 31 squadrons were attacking the enemy forces in support of our ground troops. 3rd September, 23 squadron. It is the Nat versus the Sabre. Squadron leader Trevor Keeler, on an offensive sweep, shoots down the first Sabre jet and is soon followed by flight captain VS Pathania and squad leader AJS Sandhu who bring down two more sabers while escorting misters. Already by 4th September, the Nat is emerging as the little hero of the sky. On the 6th afternoon, the PAF launches attacks on Adampur, Halwara and Pathankot air bases, where they are successfully intercepted by hunters based at Halwara. Flight Lieutenant D.N. Vathor and Flying Officer Neb of No. 27 Squadron and flying officers Gandhi and Pingale of number 7 squadron. Between them, shoot down another three sabers. Despite Pakistan's comparatively advanced radar systems, the IAF Mister and Canberra pilots were successfully hitting Pakistani forces where it hurt most by attacking their lines of communication and supplies, by blowing up convoys and trains. Having plunged into a war by attacking Kashmir, Pakistan found itself in a fast deteriorating situation. Look out port, 10 miles. Uh, I'm looking, I'm looking. Carry I got him, I got him. 
Gentlemen, before we get on with the operational briefing today, there is something I want you all to hear. This is a letter which I received from Bombay yesterday. My dear Air Marshal Arjun Singh, I am studying in class 3. I am 9 years old. I will break enemy tanks and planes. I have gone. Please call me. Claims and counterclaims after a war tend to be exaggerated, especially where the outcome has not been very decisive. In fact, post-65, both sides claim to be victorious. But it is now a well-established fact that Pakistan's designs were blunted on all fronts. For the Indian Armed Forces, it was to be a rebuilding of confidence against an enemy equipped with sophisticated weaponry. And despite Pakistan's usual belligerent stance, in the United Nations on 22nd September, where Zulfikar Ali Bhutto talked of a thousand-year war, Pakistan agreed to a ceasefire within the next 24 hours. Post-65, the MiG-21 supersonic fighters were inducted into the Air Force, giving it a deadly cutting edge. Number 28 was the first squadron to be equipped with these Delta Wing aircraft, and their performance in the days to come was to add tremendously to the stature of the Indian Air Force. But sir, what about the parent cap built in the NAT? Isn't it inadequate? <laughs> inadequate for what? With our two 30 mm guns and with our turning capability, we can knock down anything. In this particular aircraft, the guns are fitted adjacent to the air intakes. So, uh, will you please help the pilot house inside the cockpit? Yes, sir. Are you by chance related to Warrant Officer Sekhon, sir? Yes, he's my father. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I had been with him in KKD, sir. A major handicap in 1965, the air defense system was streamlined and enhanced by the setting up of various radar units that brought the entire northern half of the country under the electronic eye. Aircraft types were classified into particular fighter squadrons for specialist roles. Ground batteries of surface-to-air missiles were organized to lend teeth to the defense system, besides the air defense artillery units, which had already been integrated. Five and a half years after the Indo-Pak War of 1965, war clouds loomed over the subcontinent again. The crackdown on East Pakistan happened on the night of 25-26 March. The resistance of the rebels in different parts of the country was put down firmly by end of April. Streams of refugees then poured into India across the border. As the socio-economic pressure began to build up on our system, it was then just a matter of time. Senseless as it may seem from their point of view with hindsight, Yahya Khan had opened the genie he could not hope to bottle again. A genie which was to tear the two Pakistans apart. A genie which was to see the birth of a new nation, Bangladesh. The sabers have been coming into the Boya salient again and again. They are coming in low from Tezgao, rendezvousing over Jesso, from where they form into a stream and pull up in a northwesterly direction towards the border. At the border, they are turning to 180 degrees onto a southerly course, strafing our armor and then making a low-level getaway towards Jesso. They are doing this seven to eight times during each sortie. The trouble is, the sabers are over Indian territory for a very short while. The salient being only three kilometers wide. This is where you have to try and get them.
Following Pakistan's airstrike on nine Indian airfields on the evening of 3rd December 1971, the gloves were off. At night, Canberra fighter bombers from their bases around Agra pounded almost all Pakistani airfields in the west. While in the eastern theater, MiG-21s from number 4 squadron escorted hunters from number 17 squadron in the first fighter strike of the war against Kurbitola airfield the next morning. Minutes later, another strike force of MiG-21s, this time from number 28 squadron, was screaming towards Tezgaon. Number 221 squadron, equipped with Sukhois, also hit Tezgaon, destroying three Sabre jets on the ground. Three NAT squadrons, 15, 22 and 24, were used in close support of the army, while in the west, the IAF hit deep inside Pakistan, where in spectacular fashion, the Sui gas plant and the Karachi oil refinery took a pounding. Arm doors open. Left, left, steady, steady, steady. Right, steady, steady. Bomb gone, bomb target. Closing bomb doors, accelerating 450. Turn right, 0 for 0. In a war of spectacular results, the Hunter versus the tanks at Longewala was to stand out for the incredible results achieved by a small detachment of IAF aircraft. Welcome to Charlie, report my signal over. Armor noises being heard from direction of pillar 638, probably heading towards Kharatar, over. I can hear them loud and clear, over. Javed or smile, Dushman ka position mere saamne, mere daine taraf se move or position ikhtiyar karo. The tanks are about 400 meters from me now. I'm standing by to engage them. Over. Sao sao, air shelter na gaya. Telephone lines are still down, but GOC 12 Dev has just come up on the radio and informed us that there is a heavy Pakistani armor thrust developing along this axis towards Ramgarh. Okay, Tali, this is where we come in. All aircraft serviceable? Yes, sir. Four fighters and two trainers. And if this report is true, we can use our aircraft in rotation and hit them really hard. Gosain and Yadav, you will fly as Mission 101 Alpha and Bravo. From the Army reports, there are plenty of tanks in the area. Therefore, make every rocket count and once you finish them, follow up with front guns also. Remember, Mission 102 will be coming overhead as you are leaving. Pakistan's 
जल्दी हवाई फौज मदद के लिए भेजो वरना वापस मुड़ना नामुमकिन है इन ऑल फोर्टी पाकिस्तानी टैंक्स फॉर लेफ्ट बर्निंग इन द डेजर्ट एंड द थ्रेट टू जैसलमेर वॉज ओवर विद इन अ पीरियड ऑफ थर्टी सिक्स आवर्स एनी क्वेश्चन थैंक यू निगम एंड नो जोक्स अबाउट मैथ फोकास्ट प्लीज यू गाइज आर ऑन अ स्पेशल मिशन यू एयरक्राफ्ट आर आर्म्ड विद अ स्पेशल बॉम्ब विच हैज टू बी रिलीज फ्रॉम हाइट ऑफ फिफ्टी फीट ओवर द रन वे In the east, the net on Dhaka closed in at breathtaking speed. By the 6th of December, the PAF in Bangladesh had been neutralized. Foco, rushing in on the Agartala Ashuganj axis, had one of its key brigades airlifted across the Meghna to Narsingdi on 10th, 11th December. While around the same time, Indian paratroopers were dropped at Tangail in a drop involving 50 Dakotas, packets, AN-12s, and caribou. एरिया but to put the fear of god into them pull up over dhaka and make a dummy pass over the area then go in and blast to them with rockets General Niazi assures me that the fallback on Dhaka is only a temporary strategic. Your Excellency looks like in another air raid. I get better, Captain. Let's go. Dhaka is now the free capital of a free country. The instrument of surrender was signed. in dhaka at 16:31 hours indian standard time by lieutenant general a nazi on behalf of the pakistan eastern command lieutenant general jagjit singh arora goc in command of the indian and bangladesh forces in the eastern theater accepted the surrender years have since gone by and with it the aircraft which dominated our times have given way to a younger more modern and deadly generation the dakotas packets mistairs sukhois and nats have switched off their engines to the grateful last salute of a proud nation and in their place fly the il 76s the an 32s the mi 26s jaguars mirages and the mix Remember the winds are 
down the runway today. Okay, and you are going to have a slight tailwind component on downwind as well as on base leg. So after turning base leg, anticipate your turn on to finals looking at the runway and commence your turn early. Ashish, remember you will have to come with the offset on to finals. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Generation after generation of pilots wind their way through the various training institutions which are the arteries of the world's fourth largest air force. From HL manufactured HPT-32s and Kiran jet trainers, pilots earmarked for the fighter stream move on to the Polish Iskaras, graduating thereafter to operational frontline squadrons. Strategic photo reconnaissance had been the task assigned to some of the Indian Air Force's hurricane squadrons in Burma during World War II. Since the late 50s, the role was performed by the IAF's Canberra PR-57s. Today, the service requires ultra-high altitude aircraft to meet its requirements. A small number of enigmatic Foxbat MiG-25Rs propelled the Air Force into the Trisonic era in September 1982. Codenamed Operation Pavan, the mission of the Indian peacekeeping force in northern and eastern Sri Lanka lasted some 30 months and the statistics tell the story. The number of sorties flown by our transport and helicopter crews to and within Sri Lanka without a single aircraft lost or mission aborted. In support of nearly 100,000 troops and paramilitary forces, Mi 8s of numbers 109 and 119 helicopter units operated to scores of scattered helipads all over the island's northern and eastern provinces. One two five helicopter unit equipped with Mi 25 gunships were utilized to provide suppressive fire against militant strong points and to interdict coastal and river Rhine traffic. setting up of various base repair depots in the last decade has seen the Air Force expand into fields hitherto handled by organizations like the HAL. Today, the Indian Air Force has truly emerged as a multi-dimensional organization, which, in the fine traditions of its young life, 
continues to blaze a trail of glory for the ashes of their fathers and the temples of their gods.